Okay, so when we left off on Friday, we were talking about the hypothalamic hormones, uh, and specifically we were talking about posterior pituitary. The unique thing about posterior pituitary is that the hormones are being produced in the hypothalamus, are hexonally transported down to neurons that exist within the posterior pituitary, and then are released by the posterior pituitary um, tissue. Right where we left off, should have been dealing with antidiuretic hormone. D was oxytocin. D, antidiuretic hormone. So oxytocin was made in the paraventricular nucleus uh, of the hypothalamus, and then antidiuretic hormone is going to be coming from the superoptic nucleus. And it's sent down those neurons to the hypothalamus to be released. Now, uh, in anterior pituitary, again, we have our releasing our inhibiting factor substances or hormones that interact with the tissue of the anterior pituitary to interact with specific cell types that produce specific hormones. And those, those hormones are released into the general circulation and they circulate every, absolutely everywhere, but also to their target tissue. So, whenever we look at endocrine hormones, the way that we model this interaction of hormone being released interacting with another tissue is through what's called an endocrine axis or endocrine axes. And what the endocrine axis is is just a description of all-inclusive source tissues, target tissues, hormones being produced. And I'm going to sort of highlight one of these and kind of bring out, hopefully, some unifying features for a variety of different endocrine axes. Okay, so what I'm going to, the, the specific axis that I'm going to take a look at today is going to be the hypothalamus, pituitary, and then we're going to look at the adrenal gland, but for general terms, hypothalamus, pituitary, and then another endocrine gland or tissue. So hypothalamus does something, interacts with the pituitary, which does something to interact with another endocrine or a target tissue. Okay, so to make things more specific here, we are going to take a look at the adrenal gland filling in as the other endocrine tissue. No end there, adrenal gland. Okay, so you would call this the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. And again, this is the model or the description of how all of these different endocrine tissues and glands interact with their hormones. So this particular endocrine axis is in um, similar fashion as many of the other endocrine axes, typically begins with a higher brain center. And so higher brain center, really what you're thinking about here is something going on in the central nervous system. It's probably a group of neurons or um, uh, individual neurons that are sensing some sort of information, typically about the internal environment of the organism. So we're going to sense the internal environment, 
and we're sensing what changes are occurring. Because remember, this is all coming back to homeostasis. So as the inver internal environment begins to change, homeostasis says, I want to make sure that I don't go out of the bounds of my dynamic equilibrium. And so I'm going to initiate some sort of, uh, uh, some sort of effect or, or sequence of events that's going to help to maintain a normal homeostatic process. So in specific reference here to the adrenal glands, the adrenal glands are going to respond to changes in um, stress-related uh, physiology. And so the internal uh, changes that are occurring that are going to be sensed by the higher brain centers are going to be things like glucocorticoid concentration. Now, glucocorticoid concentration is, uh, these are going to be, uh, the glucocorticoids are going to be molecules that are actually going to elevate in the presence of certain stressors. Now, when these stressors interact with the organism, the organism needs to make some sort of decision on what it's going to do to respond to these stressors. Is it going to run away? Is it going to try to hide? Is the organism going to curl up in a little ball? No matter what it does, its action most likely is going to require energy. And so where do we get energy from? Ultimately, it comes from glucose. Eventually, glucose is converted into ATP, but we have to mobilize glucose in order to begin to produce ATP for the cells to use to propagate this response or to uh, undertake the, the response. So with glucocorticoid levels high, we're going to have a response that says, hey, we need glucose. We need to begin to metabolize that glucose. And so we get this need for glucose metabolism. This is sensed in the higher brain centers. The glucocorticoids themselves are going to fluctuate in their levels. Higher brain center is going to pick up on that particular response. And the nerves in the higher brain centers, you're going to have this nervous system interaction with the hypothalamus. Now, in the hypothalamus, responding to this nervous input, we are going to have specific hypothalamic cells that are going to begin to release CRH, corticotropin-releasing hormones. So this is one of our releasing hormones. Where is it going from the hypothalamus? Enters into that specialized portal system, our hypophyseal portal system, and is going to begin to push that CRH down towards the cells of the pituitary. In all reality, because it's getting into the bloodstream, it's going everywhere, right? So CRH ends up in the hypophyseal portal system. So we're now increasing CRH in the bloodstream and that hypophyseal portal system. The first place that blood is going to go and the CRH is going to interact with is going to be anterior pituitary. Now, once we begin to interact with the anterior pituitary, we're going to have some sort of reaction. And the reaction here is for the anterior pituitary to begin to produce a hormone called ACTH. So here you can see the, the whole model of this endocrine axis starting from the hypothalamus ending in the adrenal cortex of the adrenal gland. And so we have our stressor that causes our, our higher brain centers to begin to produce CRH, which has a positive effect on the pituitary, and now we're beginning to produce adrenocorticotropic 
hormone. Adrenal corticotropic hormone, ACTH. The specific cells in the pituitary are just simply going to be called corticotrophs. Remember, T-R-O-P-H-S just simply refers to the cells that are producing the hormone. So the corticotrophs begin to produce ACTH. And from the anterior pituitary, this hormone is secreted into the general circulation or into the GC. And now it's circulating everywhere. We do have some feedback into the brain. We have uh, distribution of ACTH to all of our other tissues. And in particular, one of the places that ACTH ends up is at the adrenal gland. General circulation. So from the general circulation going everywhere, targets to the adrenal gland. Now, this particular hormone, ACTH, it is now going to begin to act as a ligand. And that means it will bind to a receptor. And so it binds to receptors bound in the cell membrane, in the cells in the cortex, or the outer layer of the adrenal gland. So this is the target tissue. Okay, now... What happens once we have that ligand receptor binding? We form this thing called a hormone receptor complex. This is where we're actually going to see physiological changes begin to happen within the organism, all starting here in the cells of the adrenal cortex. So the cells begin to respond in the adrenal, uh, in the adrenal gland. And one of the things that happens is those cells begin to grow. <laughs> So they increase in size, and they also begin to produce glucocorticoids. And so these are the molecules that are going to help to respond to the stressors. The glucocorticoids enter into the bloodstream. And now begin to circulate all over. The glucocorticoids from here after circulating all over begin to interact with a variety of other cells, primarily things like adipose tissue and the liver, which are major glucose storage locations or organs within physiology. And we begin to have glucose metabolism altered. Now we're dumping glucose into the bloodstream. We now have enough of that raw nutrient for energy production, ATP production, that we can begin to really fully respond to the stressor. Again, this is happening in a matter of seconds. It may be upwards of um, five to 10 seconds before we have full glucose inundation into the bloodstream or full production of ATP for whatever response that we need here, running away from the bear on campus or whatever you may have. So this is a basic rundown. We could take other endocrine organs and we could pop them in there. We could say that there is a uh, high level of um, follicle stimulating hormone indicating that we have progression of the menstrual cycle and that's going to cause estrogen and progesterone release by the ovaries to help regulate that process. We could go through and we could pop in all of these details as we build these different endocrine axes. What I haven't hit on a whole lot just yet is how all of this is happening here. How is glucose metabolism actually being altered? How are we having the hormone interacting with the receptor causing those changes in the cell? That area of endocrinology is what is known as molecular endocrinology. It is the endocrinology of what's happening with all of the molecules. And that's where we're going to begin now. Okay, so molecular endocrinology. Really, the, the, the big 
kind of picture of molecular endocrinology. What is molecular endocrinology actually doing? Or what is it study, I guess I should say? Well, molecular endocrinologists study the hormone chemistry, synthesis, and actions, molecular actions of endocrine hormones and endocrine pathways. Yes. Is this stuff like in the book anywhere or you just need to know there's some in it? Like I've looked in a lot of it, it doesn't go in as much detail as you're going to. Yeah, so I'm giving you some extra. Okay. Um, but the book is also details a lot of these endocrine axes. You can go and find each one of them in the book. Uh, I'm just kind of giving you the basic building blocks there for the endocrine axes to give you that background so that you can build on that foundation as you go through and study the rest of the material. Uh, the molecular endocrine not as strong in the textbook. Um, it's my area of expertise, and so I like to talk about it, and so I'm going to give you some extra. Okay. So does everybody have this? All right. So dealing with the molecular endocrinology, Hormones, uh, hormone chemistry, synthesis, and action. We're just going to begin right with what's going on with chemistry. So chemistry, primarily what we're dealing with here is what is the structure? And are there any features that we can utilize to begin to pair up or categorize endocrine hormones? And there's actually a couple different systems or ways, and it depends on who you're reading, that you can order or categorize endocrine hormones. We're going to use a three-hormone category system for purposes of this class. And those three categories, one of the categories will be the steroids. Second category is going to be the monoamines. And then the third category are going to be the peptides. Now, when you hear the term peptide, you should be thinking, okay, that's proteins or parts of proteins. Okay? So steroids, monoamines, and peptides. And we'll just begin right at the top of the list, and we will deal here with the steroids. So what is this chemical class of hormones all about? So what you're looking at here now, this figure here, is a picture of all of the different types of steroid hormones. And what you're going to notice in there is there's some major classes, things like the estrogens and the androgens, and then the progestins are in there as well, the glucocorticoids, mineral corticoids. And there's one unifying feature, or one unifying biochemical molecule, and that's going to be your cholesterol. That's going to be a 20-carbon ring-structured molecule that all of these other hormones are going to be derived from. <coughs> okay, so derived from cholesterol... Uh, and obviously, underneath this whole uh, major heading of steroids, the estrogens and the androgens and the progestins and the mineral corticoids and the glucocorticoids, these are all additional subcategories for the steroid hormones. So when we reference things like the androgens or the estrogens or the progestins, we're referencing a category of hormones called the sex steroids. And from here, they are produced by cholesterol. Cholesterol is still that uh, foundational molecule, but there's sex steroids because they're being produced in our sex, uh, our sex tissue. So being produced in the cells found in the testes and in the ovaries, okay? Uh, a second major class here are going to be the corticosteroids.
And the corticosteroids, they are actually going to be derived from cholesterol, but in the cortex of the adrenal gland. The cortex of the adrenal gland. Hence their name cortico, meaning from the cortex. So the sex steroids includes the estrogens, the androgens, and the progestins, and then our, our uh, corticosteroids include both the glucocorticoids, which are um, related to glucose. Um, they, they actually will have uh, sugar compounds uh, bound up, and then the mineral corticoids will have a, a mineral uh, originating base. All right, the next structural class is going to be the monoamines. Now, hopefully you see in here the term amine, and hopefully your mind immediately goes to the chemical called an amino acid. And it's mono, which means one, and so this is going to be derived from a single, this, this class of hormones is derived from a single amino acid. Okay, derived from amino acids. Now, in this derivation process, we are going to chemically alter the amino acid, but along the way, the monoamines are actually going to maintain some of the amino acid function. And this is primarily ascribed to that amino acid functional group. That's supposed to be group. The functional groups that are left over. So things like the carboxyl group and the amino group, the nitrogen-containing amino group, are still going to be present in these monoamines. Now, we've actually run into this class of uh, molecule in the past because we actually find that the, amino, the monoamines include several molecules that also act in neurotransmission. So include several neurotransmitters. And so we're going to find things like dopamine and norepinephrine and epinephrine. Uh, but there is also a special group of the monoamines. And chemically, they contain a uh, a ring structure that's called a catechol group, and we're going to call these the catecholamines. And in fact, it's the catecholamines that are some of the most prominent and prevalent of these uh, monoamine hormones. And so what you're looking at here now on the screen is you actually have these monoamines with the special catechol group, that extra ring structure on each of these, derived from um, the uh, amino acids phenylalanine and tyrosine to get dopamine, epinephrine, and norepinephrine. And notice that we have a variety of different enzymes that catalyze the specific reaction, reorganizing electrons and bonds to produce the new molecule. So again, we're calling these the catecholamines because they have that catechol ring, that chemical structure called the catechol. And this is at the center, or at the heart, of these hormones. And they include dopamine, norepinephrine, epinephrine. Norepinephrine, epinephrine, anyone know the other name? Yeah, adrenaline and noradrenaline. All right, so the next uh, and final major class of hormones for 
from, from a chemi chemistry perspective are the peptides. Again, when we hear peptides, I want you to really be thinking in terms of related to protein. Okay, so what you're looking at here, this is actually the molecule insulin, the pancreatic hormone that uh, helps to regulate glucose levels in the bloodstream. Now, a peptide is a molecule that just simply is a chain of amino acids. So the mono means they were related to the amino acids as well, but it was a monoamine, meaning a single am uh, amino acid. Now we're dealing with chains of amino acids, and that's one of the big differentiating factors between the monoamines and the peptides. So we're going to actually see that most of these peptides, or most of the peptides in endocrinology, are going to be anywhere from 300, uh, from 3 to 200 or more amino acids in length. Now, we do like to sort of group things even further here as well, and, and this is primarily going to be based off of the number of amino acids that show up or are present inside of the, the, uh, the hormone itself. So when we have a short chain of amino acids, we refer to this as an oligopeptide. So just a short amino acid chain. So we're talking 20 or 30 individual amino acids in the molecule. And then as we get a little bit longer, as we tend towards that 200 plus amino acid length chain, these are going to be polypeptides. Yeah, you're, you're looking at 20 to 30 and, plus, and, and over up towards the 200 are going to be our polypeptides. Now, the thing that's, uh, I guess, most interesting about this is these are the first class of hormones that we've talked about that are actually going to be genetically defined. The steroids are not genetically defined. There's no such thing as a gene for testosterone. There are genes for the enzymes that use cholesterol to produce testosterone, but testosterone is not genetically defined. So it's, it's not a protein. Amino acids, same thing. We're modifying an individual amino acid, but there is no gene for dopamine. Dopamine is an individual amino acid chemical. The enzymes are harbored inside of the genetic material. But with the polypeptides, or with the peptides, I should say, we actually have a gene for insulin, and we have a gene for glucagon. So these are going to be directly defined in the genome. They will have a gene. Now, if you just think about this in a little bit uh, more extended way beyond the, the notes, beyond the lecture, you begin to think about how these hormones are coming into existence, and you might actually be able to begin to think about how they might act and what characteristics they might actually have. You know that the steroid hormones are derived from cholesterol. Cholesterol is a lipid. These hormones are all going to easily pass through cell membranes because they're lipid bilayers. Whereas most of our peptides are actually more hydrophilic and cannot cross through that hydrophobic region through the membrane. So all of a sudden, you take that a step further, we're probably going to have membrane-bound receptors for a lot of our peptide hormones because they can't cross through the membrane. And since the steroids can cross through, we're probably going to see our receptors housed inside of the cell in the cytoplasm and in the nucleoplasm. Now, that's not a hard and fast rule, and in fact, over the last 10 years, what we've begun to realize is that the steroids actually interact through both cytosolic and nucleosolic receptors and also membrane-bound receptors as well. And so the physiology, the potential for physiology and physiological changes just seems to continue to get larger and larger. Okay, so those three major classes, chemical classes, is what you'll need to rely on in this particular class. 
moving on from there, how do we get from cholesterol to testosterone? How do we get from amino acids to the catecholamines? What is the synthesis that is going to occur? So starting again with the steroids, this class of hormone, we are going to need cholesterol. So cholesterol is going to need to be the starting material. So where do we get cholesterol from? Where does it all begin? Well, we know that there are genetic sources and dietary sources for cholesterol. Most people get a large amount of their cholesterol, their daily cholesterol, comes in from food. So you go up to the calf for lunch today, and you have a hamburger. That hamburger is going to have cholesterol in it. You're going to consume that. It's going to be ingested, pulled into the digestive tract, into the bloodstream, and distributed throughout the body. So incoming from food, we're going to call that the dietary source, which is one form of cholesterol that can be utilized to generate our steroid hormones. But we have a second source, and everybody colloquially knows that as the genetic or the familial hereditary form of cholesterol. In reality, what happens here is we are actually going to utilize acetyl-CoA, which is one of our molecules in the middle of cellular respiration. It's right after uh, pyruvate transportation, in fact, pyruvate transport into the mitochondria is converted into acetyl-CoA on the way. Acetyl-CoA interacts or combines with oxaloacetate at the Krebs cycle to form citric acid, which is the beginning of the Krebs cycle. So we can, we're, we're constantly producing or biosynthesizing acetyl-CoA, and we're going to use some of that acetyl-CoA to generate and produce cholesterol itself. So we're taking some of it in, in our diet, and we're actually going to get some of this from acetyl-CoA. So the image you have here on the screen now, you can see that we have a group of enzymes that are going to help to generate from acetyl-CoA a couple different intermediaries on our way here at the bottom to generate cholesterol. Now this biosynthesis of cholesterol is what we call our hereditary source. Good. Now, in all reality, what we have here for the synthesis of cholesterol from acetyl-CoA is just a long list, a long list of enzymes. Now, across the human population, this long list of enzymes, there are a variety of different versions of these enzymes and the variety of different versions of these enzymes cause very large amounts or very big differences in function. And so there are some of these enzymes in some humans that produce cholesterol really effectively. And so those individuals are going to have a much higher rate or higher level of hereditary-based cholesterol or, or, or hereditary origins cholesterol, right? Some people, they don't have as efficient uh, of these enzymes, and so they have a much lower level of that cholesterol. So in the human population, cholesterol levels are going to vary based off of the types of these enzymes, the versions of these enzymes, if, if you will, that exist. 
So for some people, cholesterol from a hereditary source is a big problem because they produce so much of it because of very efficient enzymes. For some uh, other individuals, it's not a big of, as big of a deal because of inefficient enzymes. Now, if you're up on your drugs and up on your pharmacology for cholesterol regulation, you may recognize a drug called Lipitor. One of these enzymes, which is going to be HMG-CoA reductase, which is right up here at the top. You can see that after acetyl-CoA is converted uh, into 3-hydroxy-3-methylglutaryl-CoA, we have an enzyme HMG-CoA reductase, which converts it into methylonic acid. The HMG-CoA reductase is actually going to be blocked by a group of drugs called statins, which Lipitor is one of them. So individuals who have really efficient cholesterol biosynthesis, we can give them statins. It causes HMG-CoA reductase to be reduced, and we have this uh, reduction in the rest of the pathway. Now you also notice that there's, here, so here's our statins here, and then you have the bisphosphonates that uh, regulate a couple of those enzymes down there to help try to uh, manage that cholesterol pathway for individuals who produce very high levels of hereditary source cholesterol. So your cholesterol, you can get it from your diet or you can get it from this uh, biological pathway. Once you have cholesterol, it will interact further downstream Yeah, this is still under synthesis under steroids. Okay, so you're going to have further downstream synthesis. It's basically cholesterol is going to enter into a variety of other biochemical pathways. One of them will lead to the progesterones. One of them will lead to the, uh, uh, the androgens and one to the uh, estrogens and so on and so forth. And really what's happening here, cholesterol again is a 20 carbon molecule. And it has a variety of functional groups attached up to a variety of different carbons uh, within the within that skeletal structure. And enzymes are going to take that cholesterol and they're going to begin to alter the side chains in bonding to generate new molecules or new steroids. Now most of this is all connected together and basically the sequence is to go from the progesterones to the androgens, the androgens to the estrogens. So just an example here of how cholesterol starts out, moves its way through this pathway to get to something like 17 beta estradiol, which is one of our most potent estrogens in human physiology. We convert all of these cholesterol molecules through all of these different enzymes to testosterone, and the testosterone interacts with a enzyme called aromatase. And it is going to be converted into 17 beta estradiol. So testosterone interacts with aromatase to form 17 beta estradiol. So you have a series of enzymes that are catalyzing small little portions of reactions or small reactions, changing incrementally cholesterol to eventually the estrogens. Now again, we're not talking about proteins here. We're talking about steroids, cholesterol-derived molecules. So there is no steroid gene. We're not going to be able to parse the genome and find the testosterone gene or the 17-beta estradiol gene. But what is present in the genome are all of these enzymes. All of these enzymes catalyzing these reactions are proteins. So the enzymes in the pathway
are the proteins that come from the genome that they have a gene. So there actually is, if you're looking here at cholesterol synthesis still, there actually is a gene for HMG-CoA reductase. We have a gene for it. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say on the synthesis of the steroids. Uh, now let's move on to the monoamines. So someone real quick, what is the starting material for the monoamines? Anyone remember? Single amino acid. I'm just going to abbreviate that as AA. So we're using amino acids, and we can actually use a variety of different amino acids. There are two particular amino acids that are very, very common in production pathways for monoamine hormones. So our most common are going to be the amino acid tyrosine and the amino acid tryptophan. So tyrosine and tryptophan. Where are we actually going to get our amino acids from? Normally what we do is we grab the amino acids from a source protein. So we'll have an amino acid source, which is a protein, which is going to contain a variety of different amino acids, but it's also going to contain things like tyrosine and tryptophan. So really what I'm saying here with the amino acid source being a protein is we have proteins that are just basically amino acid chains that are going to allow tyrosines and tryptophans and a few other amino acids to be extracted and then utilized to produce monoamines. So as we pull these amino acids out of this chain, we're going to begin to go through an alterization process using enzymes to generate altered amino acids that eventually will become monoamines and catecholamines and the like. Now, frequently what happens, these enzymes that are altering the amino acids will have some sort of new side chain, some sort of new functional group that gets added. And when we get a functional group, we get a new function. So that new function may be to act more like a monoamine rather than just a single amino acid. We might also have other molecules that are more reactive that are added to the amino acid to make that amino acid more likely to react with other chemicals and other molecules within the cell. Is that reactive molecules? Yeah, reactive molecules are added. Now, frequently what we're going to find is we'll look at a starting amino acid and it'll go through some enzymatic conversions to produce a single monoamine. And then that monoamine will be the starting point for additional monoamines. So the example I can give here, we've already sort of looked at this, where some of our monoamines act as precursors. We already looked at this with the catecholamine biosynthesis picture that I had up just a few minutes ago, where we had DOPA, which gave rise to the monoamine or catecholamine dopamine, which gave rise to epinephrine, which gave rise to nor epinephrine. So we're using phenylalanine to eventually get to dopa. Dopa is the starting point for dopamine, which is the starting point for epinephrine, which is the starting point for nor epinephrine. Yes? What are the monoamine Precursors? Why 
What's that? Epinephrine. Norepinephrine. Epi and Nora. All right, so in the last few minutes here, I'm going to dig into the synthesis of the peptides. Okay? So, synthesis of the peptides, we're actually going to have to follow more of that classic molecular cellular bio biology dogma of. DNA being transcribed into messenger RNA, messenger, I'm sorry, translate, uh, transcribed into messenger RNA, messenger RNA translated into protein, and then we're going to have post-translational modifications that are to finally get the mature final form of the peptide hormone. So all of these are going to have a gene. All of our peptides have a gene. And again, we follow what we call the central dogma of molecular biology. I'm going to put this up sort of in an annotated form. So we have a gene, DNA, it's converted into messenger RNA, eventually it makes it into protein. Or it could just be a single peptide that gets incorporated into a larger protein, whatever the case may be go from the gene to the protein, and then typically our protein is actually first going to be an inactive form, and then we have to go through the process of activating. We'll pick up with that on Wednesday.